Hey everybody, welcome back to another live stream from Synapse Care Solutions. It is week one in our new series for December called Silent Night. We're gonna focus on a holiday theme. And to start us out, we are going to have a presentation by Mary Coughlin, who is gonna share with us all about infant sleep and the importance of sleep. But then she takes it a step further and shares with us also the importance of sleep for our own health as healthcare providers, and even for the health and emotional benefits of that for our families in the NICU as well. So I hope that you'll enjoy this presentation. If you haven't already, go ahead and click that and subscribe button right here on our YouTube channel. Help us get more subscribers so that we can bring you more free content. If you would like to get some of the slides and resources from this month's live stream, we have a series of four presentations for you. Go ahead and either scan the QR code here on this screen or click the link in the show notes below so that you can get access to those resources and email reminders of when all of our presentations presentations are released. So without further ado, I hope that you enjoy this first presentation in our series of Silent Night um, with Mary Coughlin talking all about the science and the benefits and the importance of sleep for all of us, for babies, for staff, and for parents. So I hope that you enjoy it and I'll see you at the end. Our next presentation is Miss Mary Coughlin McNeil, better known as Mary Coughlin. And Mary Coughlin is an inspirational speaker, motivational coach, and transformational consultant with a clinical background that spans over 30 years. Mary is a leader in the field of neonatal nursing, an internationally recognized expert in the field of trauma-informed, age-appropriate care in the NICU. And she has many books and articles, as we heard earlier from Sharon, under her belt, and she's currently the president and founder of Caring Essentials Collaborative. So, I count her as one of my closest friends. We get to chat often, and I'm so glad that she is here with you. And I just assign her topics, and she always rises to the occasion. And so this topic is one that I know is very, she's very passionate about, and she's put some new spins on it. So I'm excited to hear it. So welcome, Mary. Hi, everybody. I am just so wicked excited and honored to have this opportunity to speak to you guys at the end of today and tomorrow as well. So I'm just trying to bring my HPA access down. I know this is so goofy that I get nervous every time I speak, but I do get nervous every time I speak, so hopefully this will pass. And this subject, although I just need to find my thingamajiggy, is near and dear to my heart. Putting a different spin on it, as Kathy requires you to do, it was a bit of a challenge. So, And I don't want to disappoint you guys. So. Hopefully you find this inf uh, information interesting, ask lots of questions, and I'm just going to go ahead and get started, okay? All right. I should, a couple disclaimers. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I've been told I have a bit of an accent. If it bothers you, there's nothing I can do about it, okay? <laughs> just buckle up, buttercup. So um, Kathy invited me to talk about this idea of sleep and what it means for not just the babies, but I'm also going to talk about just in general what does sleep mean for us as adults, the implications for us as shift workers, also the implications of sleep and sleep deprivation on the parents that we're serving, and then we'll wrap up with the babies, okay? Okay, you're all just so nice and smiley, it's so lovely, okay. So these are my learning objectives, hopefully I hit them all, and we'll kick off with a video. We certainly know that a lack of sleep will actually prevent your brain from being able to initially make new memories. So it's almost as though without sleep, the memory inbox of the brain shuts down and you can't commit new experiences to memory. So those new incoming informational emails are just bounced and you end up feeling as though you're amnesic. You can't essentially make and uh, create those new memories. We also know that a lack of sleep will lead to an increased development of a toxic protein in the brain that is called beta amyloid and that is associated with Alzheimer's disease because it is during deep sleep at night when a sewage system within the brain actually kicks into high gear and it starts to wash away this toxic protein, beta amyloid. So if you're not getting enough sleep each and every night, more of that Alzheimer's related protein will build up. The more protein that builds up, the greater your risk of going on to develop dementia in later life. What are the effects of sleep deprivation on the body? Well, there are many different effects. Firstly, we know that sleep deprivation affects the reproductive system. We know that men who are sleeping just five to six hours a night 
have a level of testosterone which is that of someone 10 years their senior. So a lack of sleep will age you by almost a decade in terms of that aspect of virility and wellness. We also know that a lack of sleep impacts your immune system. So after just one night of four to five hours of sleep, there is a 70% reduction in critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells. And that's the reason that we know that short sleep duration predicts your risk for developing numerous forms of cancer. And that list currently includes cancer of the bowel, cancer of the prostate, as well as cancer of the breast. In fact, the link between a lack of sleep and cancer is now so strong that recently the World Health Organization decided to classify any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. So in other words, jobs that may induce cancer because of a disruption of your sleep-wake rhythms. We also know that a lack of sleep impacts your cardiovascular system because it is during deep sleep at night that you receive this most wonderful form of effectively blood pressure medication. Your heart rate drops, your blood pressure goes down. If you're not getting sufficient sleep, you're not getting that reboot of the cardiovascular system. So your blood pressure rises. You have, if you're getting six hours of sleep or less, a 200% increased risk of having a fatal heart attack or a stroke in your lifetime. There is a global experiment that is performed on 1.6 billion people twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. <laughs> and we know that in the spring, when we lose one hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. Another question perhaps is, what is the recycle rate of a human being? How long can we actually last without sleep before we start to see declines in your brain function or even impairments within your body? And the answer seems to be about 16 hours of wakefulness. Once you get past 16 hours of being awake, that's when we start to see mental deterioration and physiological deterioration in the body. We know that after you've been awake for 19 or 20 hours, your mental capacity is so impaired that you would be as deficient as someone who is legally drunk behind the wheel of a car. So if you were to ask me what is the recycle rate of a human being, it does seem to be about 16 hours and we need about eight hours of sleep to repair the damage of wakefulness. Wakefulness essentially is low level brain damage. Um, so yeah, I, when I first saw that video, I was blown away. I had known some of the information, but when you're sitting down and you're focused on it, and I think about when I was a bedside nurse or a nurse practitioner, and I would work double shifts. I'd work 16 hours, and over the course of a week, you could work more than 40, right? You could easily work more than 40 hours a week, and not even give it a second thought that I was really adversely impacting my health. Or wellness. I had heard the information about driving tired is equivalent to driving drunk. I had heard that kind of stuff. But that's not me. I can still drive home after a, a double shift when I've done evening night, a double kind of a thing. And you think you're going home, you think you're alert, and then you pull into your driver and you're like, geez, I don't remember the ride thing. And so I, th I, th I thought that this was really an interesting way of kicking off this topic since we're going to be talking about this idea of sleep and its importance for the clinician, for the parent, as well as the baby. And these are cumulative effects, okay? It's not like you work one double shift and you're doomed. That's not what they're really trying to say. But it's accumulative over time. But the thing that's really annoying about this is how incredibly insidious it is. So, and sleep is one of those things. It's, I, I think of it like skin, which I know sounds really weird. But you're in somebody's face all the time, right? Everyone knows everyone has skin. It's their thing. And because it's so in your face, we underplay or downplay the incredibly important role that it plays in our day-to-day -day life. You don't even think about it, right? Who thinks about how you feel or how you touch or how anything affects you? And the same thing with sleep. You think, I can suck it up. It's okay. It's just a night, you know? I mean, we had to go. It was a great party, you know, or all these other different things. And I think what what this subject really brought to me is really being mindful of how that those insidious cumulus 
um, epochs of sleep deprivation really can derail my healthy development. Now, as a kid, you think, no big deal. As a young nurse, I thought I was invincible, nothing's going to happen, I'm fine. And then over time, you start working with colleagues. And I was a night shift nurse for a long time. And I know colleagues who had issues with cancer. And I never made the connections. It was just like, oh, that's really bad. But I never made these connections. Now, is it a direct line? No, it's multifactorial. But to think that it's a contributing factor, I think, really should raise our awareness about how we need to approach our own sleep, but also be able to recognize sleep challenges or sleep compromise in our colleagues, in family, and, and the people that we serve. You OK with that? And so I thought, well, this is a cool way of really kind of highlighting, again, bringing everybody back to my core competency, the, these, these ideas of the core measures. And most recently, when we def well, rewind. So when we first developed the core measures back in 2008, and they were first published in 2009 with um, the brilliant Sharon Gibbons and the, the late Stephen Hoth, um, we were looking at a way of categorizing disease-independent best practices. And so we did this exhaustive literature search and came up with these themes in the literature, which we then organized like thus, right? So protected sleep is a big deal. And these are all, when I generally speak of these, I'm speaking with regards to neonatal disease-independent practices, but I've been working with a group of grown-up clinicians to translate these into adult best practices because they're relevant across the continuum. I mean, no matter where you are in your life, right, sleep's important, family's important, right, your environment's important, that, and that sort of thing. So it seemed appropriate that this idea of protected sleep for the neonate is apropos for adults as well. And what does it look like? It looks very similar to the neonate. Right? We look at protecting sleep. It's doing supportive activities that, that support my sleep health. It's involving my family in my sleep, like telling everybody else in the house, lights out after 10, no, no potties because I can't sleep. Or telling your, the person that you're sharing a bed with, you're hogging all the covers, I need some of the covers so I can go to sleep. So it's creating that environment. And this is what we do for our babies too, but we just don't think about it for ourselves. And so in looking at the literature, this term, in the sleep, it's called the sleep journal. Sleep, it's not the journal, it's sleep, but it's a journal. And they, of course, they talk exhaustively about sleep and sleep medicine and the physiology of sleep. And one of the things that I thought was remarkable is that the commentary that despite our knowledge and our understanding about the incredibly important role of sleep, we still are not very well versed on a lot of the neurohumoral humoral and neurophysiological phenomenon to the details that are associated with sleep. We just know it's wicked important. And we go backwards. We look at the negative effects of not having enough sleep to kind of then through the back door inform us that, well, then it must be really important because we don't want these bad things to happen. And so how they define sleep health. See this first red box? These are the dimensions of sleep health. And so I'll start from the bottom. So it's about the duration of your sleep. How many hours do you get a night? Now, so we'll, I'm just going to focus on grown-ups right now, okay? So just think to yourselves, and I'm going to have to have you actually do a little quiz as we progress through the slides. How many hours of sleep do you get a night or a day if you're a, a night shift worker? How many hours in a 24-hour period of sleep do you get? What's the efficiency of that sleep? And when they use the word efficiency, what they're talking about is how long does it take you to fall asleep? And if you get aroused during the night, are you able to easily fall back asleep? And lots of folks struggle with this. So efficiency is another kind of parameter that defines your sleep health or, your, and, or the quality of your sleep, obviously. The timing of your sleep. When do you go to sleep? When is, when is the best time for you to, you to sleep? And then flipping over to look at the benefits then of that quality of sleep, how alert do you feel during the day? Do you feel refreshed when you wake up? So think about all these things, because there is a quiz, OK? Do you feel satisfied? So everybody this morning, we had a wicked awesome day yesterday, lots of brainiacal stuff. I think we're going to struggle with some sleep tonight, because my wheels are spinning like crazy. But we need to get some sleep. So you guys reflect. After yesterday, with all the stimulation you had, did you get a good night's sleep? Do you never get a good night's sleep? Just think about these things. And then your, the level of satisfaction. And some people just always say, oh, no matter what, I can sleep on a rock. No worries, I'll always get a good night's sleep. Versus other people that they may have a, a long duration, but the quality of it, it may not be so good. So these are the dimensions that define your sleep health. And we know that when you have optimal sleep health, that you are in a better position to have optimal general health as well. 
So we all have these sleep-wake cycles, right? Right now I'm awake, just in case you didn't know, and as I hope all of you guys are too. But when we begin the development, the developmental trajectory of our maturation over our sleep-wake cycling, you're looking at in utero, and that's the furthest part, this, oh gosh, the left side of the screen, all right? Think of that as the fetal sleep. And fetuses in general spend most of their time in this state called active sleep. And it can be up to 22 hours in a day. And family members, when you, if you have the audacity to feel somebody's belly or they invite you to feel their belly when they're pregnant, and you feel those little kick jerky movements, those little kicks for the baby, oftentimes those are active sleep movements. Active sleep is kind of the REM of immature people. And, and that's the hallmark of that is these sporadic movements. Once babies get to term, they generally, it's like a 50-50 split, right? You spend about 50% of your sleep time, not a 24-hour day, but of your sleep time, 50% is in active sleep, which is a REM-like sleep, and the other 50% is in quiet sleep, which goes on to differentiate into a non-REM sleep. And then, you know, as you progress, and I, you can kind of see the timeline on the bottom of the, um, the graph here, you know, you start decreasing your volume of REM sleep or active sleep, and you start differentiating and increasing your volume of non-REM sleep juxtaposed to the amount of time that you spend awake. And so one of the things that I find so interesting about this is people ask, and, and it, it's cool, this is a cool time, I think, to be in neonatology, because people not only are asking the question, but people are in search of the answer, which is always exciting, is, well, gee whiz, man, we're wa working in the NICU. Uh, how do I know? What state of sleep are they in? When should I wake them up? When should I not wake them up? And that sort of thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we really start diving into the baby. But this is just in general, and most of this is modulated, not in the neonatal period, but beyond that neonatal period, it's modulated by the suprachiasmic nucleus, the, the ex your exposure to light and dark that really facilitates your sleep. And so for grown-ups, particularly shift workers, how many people work nights? I can't put my arm up anymore because I don't do it anymore, but I, I did for a wicked long time, right? And we, you, it's a struggle, right? I remember not knowing how bad I felt until I went on to day shift. And it was kind of like, oh, is this how the rest of the world feels? Oh, my goodness, you know? Clarity and all these other things that when you're, when I, at least myself, not, I don't want to generalize, but when I work night shift, I just felt like I was moving through life in a fog, you know, just doing stuff, all the stuff that you have to do, and it was just foggy and not really understanding how I could change that. And, but now for shift workers, they're suggesting light showers. Have you guys heard of this? Taking a light shower during your night shift. So you go into the break room with the lights are super bright on, and you stay in there for about 15 minutes, and you give yourself a, a dose of all this light, and it shakes the cobwebs out of your brain, goes, wake up, it's daytime. And, and then you can come in and you feel alert for a little while. And actually, in some um, places, they make these cool glasses that have a rim of light around them so that you're getting light stimulation to the suprachiasmic nucleus that t fakes you out. So you think it's daytime, but, it, but uh, obviously it's not. So there's, there, there are different strategies that you can employ out there, but in general, it's just I think it's really cool and interesting to understand how all of this stuff works. And so as I alluded to, or maybe not, our occupation does have an impact on our sleep health. And so anybody who's a shift worker, okay, not just healthcare professionals, are challenged with this idea of creating these sleep routines and these sleep hygienes that really optimize their, your sleep. And you may think you've got it nailed, but I'm going to challenge you when, you when I have you do the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Quiz to really write down, be honest with it. I'm not going to collect it. Just be honest with it to determine how many hours of sleep do you get and do you feel refreshed? Or do you wait and you just zombie through those, those days? You know how some people say, I like to pack all my shifts together. I'm just going to work three or four 12s in a row, just be a zombie for those 96 hours, and then I'll be fine and I'll wake up kind of a thing. You know? Think about how that affects not just you, but the quality of service that you bring to the care that you provide. And your family, okay, I'm just saying, all right, your family is in the back seat going, oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, all right, she's, she's on a stretch, oh, my God, stay low, stay invisible, keep away from her, the thing. So it's not just the, the, the families that we serve, right, and each other, right, you, it, it's everything. And, but also what was interesting in the literature was looking at your level of compassion fatigue, uh, well, I'm sorry, compassion satisfaction. And so your vulnerability for burnout also predisposes you to sleep problems sleep disruptions, 
sleep deprivation and that sort of thing. So if you're burned out, whether it's from your work or your life is getting you down or all those other kinds, it can go the other way. So it makes you think like the chicken and the egg kind of a thing, which came first? Am I sleep deprived? And that's just setting me up to be all you know, distressed and bummed out about my work? Or am I bummed out, bummed out about my work and I'm thinking about it all the time and I'm not able to sleep and all this other kind of stuff? It doesn't really matter. It's a thing. It's a real thing. And so one of the things that this prompted me to start considering is, so I'm working with this group, Wicked Cool International Interdisciplinary Clinicians on a certification for neonatal trauma-informed care. And what we did was we identified these eight attributes of the trauma-informed professional. And one of the attributes is about personal wholeness. And that personal wholeness bit is about how do you take care of yourself? Because how you take care of yourself, right, how you are able to fill up your cup really is a measure of your health and wellness, obviously, and your commitment to top of license practice. Right? So if you're, you're just dragging and you're doing the zombie nurse kind of a thing, you know, all the time, I mean, how, and I'm not minimizing this and I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. I know it's hard. I know all of this stuff is challenging. I totally get it. But I'm just trying to put it out there for you to just kind of food, the idea of food for thought. Maybe there's a different way. And this idea of personal wholeness and how do I rejuvenate myself, one of the biggest and best ways you can do this is by creating a sleep hygiene routine for yourselves. And that sleep concept of sleep hygiene routine is not just for you as grown-ups, but it's for patients, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So what are some of the things that people do? And just shout it out. What are some of the things that you guys do to help get yourselves ready for bed? Or do you do anything at all? Anybody? You take a shower. A nice hot tub. What, what else? Brush your teeth, right? Yeah, we have these little rituals that we do. Anything else? Read, yes. Flannel pajamas, right? Anything else? Excellent, excellent. Meditating. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, and that, we'll talk about that in a little in a minute. Anything else? A cup of tea, right? So we have all of these little things. Now I would ask you, do you employ these on a regular basis? Is this a regular routine for yourselves? Because I know for myself, all of the things that you guys said. I love and they make me feel real snuggly and I can go to sleep, but I'm not good about doing that consistently for myself. Nor are the families that we take care of, right, families that we serve, because they're in crisis. And so how can we help them kind of start adopting some of these sleep hygiene routines? Because we know that their journey is just beginning, right? As their babies are getting ready for discharge, it's just starting for them. So helping them craft this is an important aspect of it too. So it's important to understand where they're coming from as well. What is their daily routine? What are their occupations? How can the information that you're discovering about what works for you be transferred over to them? Oh, she whiz, huh? Okay, so sleep and I just looked at my watch. So, and sleep and immune function, I think the gentleman on the video just did such a really great job really focusing in on that idea of how you deplete your, or you decrease your number of circulating natural killer cells. But this was a really cool graphic that speaks to that even more. Now, when you're ill, right, when you have a cold or a flu, do you find yourself really drowsy and you're draggy and you want to sleep all the time? Yeah, because when you're sleeping, that's when your body kicks into high gear and really starts helping you out combating whatever situation you're dealing with. And so that's why when you are sick, the best thing to do is go to bed. And we say that. Sometimes we think we're saying it because I can't listen to you whining anymore. I want you to go in the other room and go to sleep. But in fact, there's actually physiologic benefit to going to sleep and it optimizes your immune function. When you're sleep deprived, again, what's a negative consequence of that. And so what I want you guys to do, this is a, a validated um, quiz, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, and I'm going to have you guys all do it, and I hope that, uh, I'll read it out loud. Don't worry about the scoring thing. I'll read those instructions to you. So just on the back of a piece of paper, maybe on, your, on the back of the, the slide deck or something like that, not a big deal. These are the questions that I want you to answer. I'm not going to collect anything. I just want this to be a discovery thing for you guys, okay? When have you usually gone to bed? What's your usual nighttime hour when you usually go to bed and then how long in minutes does it usually take you to fall asleep each night when do you usually get up in the morning on average
and then this will help you with the mathematical analysis here, of how many hours of actual sleep do you get it at night? Okay. Do you all have that, those, those questions answered? All right, super. So now th this is, it's on a Likert scale. It's gonna, we're asking you now, during the past month, how often have you had trouble sleeping because you can't get to sleep within 30 minutes? If it's not a problem, it's a zero. Less than once a week, one. Once or twice a week, two. Or three or more times is three. And again, just on an app, just guesstimate. What does it feel like? You all right with that? How often have you had trouble sleeping because you wake up in the middle of the night or earlier, early in the morning, earlier than you, you wanted to? There's nothing more annoying to me than waking up before my alarm clock, especially when it's 45 minutes before. You're like, oh. And then again, zero, one, two, three. You have trouble sleeping because you have to get up to use the bathroom over the past month. You can't breathe comfortably. Zero, one, two, three. You cough or snore out loudly. So you're waking yourself up with that. You feel too cold or you feel too hot. So zero, one, two, three. The frequency over the last month, have you been woken up because you felt too cold or you felt too hot? You doing good? Am I going too slow? All right. Um, or you woke up because you had a bad dream. You have bad dreams over the past month, the frequency. Or you woke up because you had pain. You ever wake up with a Charlie Huss? And then this item here, if there's another reason what the scale is asking you is write down what that reason is and then how many times it, it has woken you up over the course of the uh, past month. If there is no other reason, it's just a zero score, okay? Y'all doing good? During the past month, how often have you had to take medicine, either prescribed or over the counter, to help you sleep? Never once a week, twice a week, or th three or more times a week. During the past month, how often have you had trouble staying awake while driving, eating meals, or engaging in social activity? And then the last, well, second to last, during the past month, how much of a problem has it been for you to keep up your enthusiasm to, to get things done? And that's really talking about the quality of your sleep. So how, many, how, how much of a problem has it been? Not a problem, less than once a week. And then question number nine, during the past month, how would you rate your sleep quality overall? Very good is a zero, fair is one, I'm sorry, fairly good is one, fairly bad is two, and very bad is three. During the past month, how would you rate your sleep quality overall? <clears throat> and now I'm going to cheat and look at this screen because I can read it better, okay? So, because we're going to give you a global score, all right? And you just write, the, you can write these numbers off to the side or however it works best. But so your number nine question. What was the number to your number nine question? And put it off on the side, because I'm going to have you add these numbers up for a global score. OK? So what was your number nine answer? What number was your number nine answer? Is that making sense? Just put that number there. And then right underneath it, what was your number two? And so for the number two score, what they're saying is, it's asking you how long it's taking you to fall asleep. If it takes you less than or equal to 15 minutes to fall asleep, that's a zero. If it takes you 16 to 30 minutes to fall asleep, that's a number one. I gotta find my thing here. If it takes you 30 to 60 minutes to fall asleep, it's a number two. And if it takes you more than an hour to fall asleep, that's a number three. So put that number underneath the number that you just calculated from your question number nine. Are you doing okay? Am I confusing you? So number nine is the last question. During the past month, how would you rate your sleep quality overall? And whatever that number was, just put that up over here in the top, that top column. The number two score is how long does it take you to fall asleep? If it, if it takes you more than an hour to fall asleep, that's a three. Less than or equal to 15 minutes, that's a zero. 
Are you guys okay? Yeah. All right, cool beans. All right. Kicking it up here. Number four. So how many hours of actual sleep do you get at night? So ha you have that number, right? And this is how you're going to score that number. If it's greater than seven, put a zero in the global score column. If it's six to seven, put a one hours of sleep a night. If it's five to six hours of sleep a night, get put a two. If you get less than five hours of sleep, put a three. You okay? You're doing wonderful. All right? Watch my watch. Okay. Let's see. Total number of hours of sleep. I want you to add up your scores for n the number five. So you know how number five it has A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J? Add up those numbers and put that over in the final column. Okay? Take your number six score. What was your number six score? Which is the question during the past question, have you had to take medication? And put that number over in the column, the global column. And then they're inviting us to take the answers to number seven and eight, number seven score plus the number eight score, and just combine them. So if, eight, if seven plus eight equals zero, the answer to number seven and the answer to number eight is zero, it's zero. Okay. If seven plus eight is a one or two, you're going to give yourself a score of one. I know this, it's so much easier if you had the handout, so I apologize, but you can find this on the web and do it yourself, and I'll give you the, it's in my reference list. You doing okay? And if your seven plus eight is a three to four, it's a two. If your seven plus eight score is a five or six, put a number three. Okay? Now get your calculators out and add all those numbers up. If you have to use a calculator. Oh. Um, and you don't have to share your score, but I'm just going to tell you, if your score is greater than five, you have opportunities to improve in your sleep health. Okay? A score of greater than five is categorized as a poor sleeper. And so that you're... You're at risk for the health consequences of sleep deprivation. Did I freak you out? Do we have some fives in here? You're at five. Right. So, 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 but I, you know what I thought when I did this quiz? I thought, this is cool because I don't really pay attention to this. Because sleep is just, everybody does sleep, right? It's not a competition. Do I have to really worry about it? And then you learn a little more about it and go, I guess I do have to worry about it. Particularly if the World Health Organization is linking sleep deprivation to cancer-causing agent, then I think we really need to pay attention to how we're managing our sleep. The prevalence of frequent health complaints among nurses, I don't know, I know it's a busy chat, but the bar that has the longest line in it is sleeplessness and lack of rest, followed very quickly by tiredness. Does this sound like you guys? Right. The work that we do is not just physically exhausting, but it's emotionally taxing as well. And that also interferes with our ability to have good quality sleep. I can't even begin to tell you how many nights I would go home, or mornings I would go home, and I bring it home with me. You're replaying, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better? Oh my God, I forgot to do this. I better call. You just make yourself crazy. And we put that all on ourselves. And we, everybody does it, and we don't think anybody else does. It's one of those things, we're very isolative about it. But I think calling it out, let's talk about the elephant on the table. We're all exhausted, we work wicked hard, and it's wreaking havoc in our health. And it really and truly is. And when it wreaks havoc in our health, we don't bring our A game to the work that we do. And that has to be a never event. Because the people that we serve are in dire straits. They need our service, they need our A game. Or as IHI likes to say, top of license performance. That's what they deserve. That's what I want if I'm a patient. I don't want some sleepy, boggy, foggy zombie nurse coming in to take care of me or anybody I care about. So as you discovered all of these things, there's a very, there's a, a very good parallel to what the parents are actually experiencing as well. So you don't even know what their backstory is, which is why there's lots of reasons why I love this concept of trauma-informed care. Because the, one of the, the key things or the fundamentals about trauma-informed care is it's shifting how you look at people and situations. It's moving from a what's wrong with you 
paradigm to a what happened to you paradigm. That changes the conversation in a minute, right? What's wrong with you is judgy, pointy fingers, and it's you. What happened to you just opens up this whole new appreciation of you as this vulnerable human being and our shared connection as fellow human beings and all this really cool stuff that I can really empathize with you in a meaningful way. And so when we understand how crappy we feel when we're foggy and groggy and sleepy, imagine how these people must feel. And you don't even know all the story. You just know that PMH, right, that, that we get told on a mission, yeah, 32 year old primary, blah, 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 blah. That defines who that person is. Ha ha, no, right? That's just the tip of the iceberg. There is a whole story behind that person that is coloring how they're coming to this trauma, how they're able to endure the trauma, how they're able to process through things and hear information. And so we really need to be mindful of that as well. And I know many of my colleagues, probably none of them in this room, but would do the thing like, because you just want to get them off your back, and you say, oh, you should just go home and get some sleep. You need your sleep. I care about you. You go get your sleep. When really, I just want you out of my hair. I want you out of my space so I can just do my thing. And, and I, although it's nice to tell them that you want them to get some sleep, they're not going to be able to go home and get some sleep, right? They're freaking out. They're too worried. They're going to be replaying the, re the, the reel and all that sort of thing. So understanding that really gives us that opportunity to be full-on healers, not just for the, the babies, but obviously for the families as well. Because if we can help them cope with the tragedy, cope with the trauma, just like Dr. Church has spoken and all the other um, eloquent speakers these past two days have talked about, we can really help them be in a better position to serve their baby and be there for their baby. And the thing that's really interesting is this one, one, one cool paper, B-U-S-S-E et al. I forget the rest of the folks, but it was a 2018 paper. And it talked about the level of stress that these parents experience, it wreaks havoc in their ability to sleep. So even though you tell them to go home, they're not sleeping, and then they come in, and they're now do, do, doing the zombie parent thing. And you're trying to tell them everything that they need to know, and you're getting all annoyed that they don't get it after you've said it three days in a row. So understanding this, and it, again, it's a vicious cycle. The more sleep-deprived they become, the less to stress-tolerant they are. And then the next thing you know, they're coming in, and they're crying, or they're screaming at you, and you're calling a code gray, and all of these other things, and you've lost that opportunity to really make a connection. So can, making sure that you're cognizant of their needs for sleep is equally as important as yourself. And then we look at sleep in the NICU. And Lahav and Sko, they've done, a, well, Lahav especially has done a lot of work looking at the auditory environment, the acoustic environment. And he does a lot of cool research looking at music therapy, but biological music, the sounds of the mother and the family and that sort of thing. But he talks about this acoustic gap. And somebody said something about sound, right? When you're trying to sleep, it's not actually... Where's my friend who slept below the potty on the, the floor above you, right? The guys that were all drunk and having a big old potty last night, and you couldn't sleep at all, right? So noise plays a big factor, and that's sleep in the NICU can be really challenging for the babies that we're serving, right? Because it's very loud, it's very busy, lots of lights, and it's all about us. I do, I want to say, when we get super protective about their, our patients wanting to protect their sleep on our terms, so we don't let the parents, we don't let the parents touch the baby when the, the baby's asleep. Only we can do that. Only we're allowed to disrupt their sleep. Give me a break. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're not going to allow the parents to touch the babies while they're asleep because you want to protect their sleep, then hands off on you too. And you need to make observations, and we'll show you how to do this, make observations so that you can recognize when is the right time to touch the baby. It can't be this hands-off for families, only me, the thing. So understanding that, understand how our routines and our rituals impact the sleep of these individuals is a really important factor. The design and the human environment and sleep, they obviously, they, they have a negative effect on us because I'm sure many of you guys go home and you still hear the alarms ringing in your ear, but for the babies as well. And these two guys did some really, in, well, these two papers rather, did some really interesting work looking at single family rooms and open bays and sound pressure and as well as alarm fatigue with nurses. 
And so all of the, they looked at how frequency, frequently these alarms went off, what the, the frequency of these critical alarms were in the two different environments, open bay and, and single family room, and nurses and how we respond to different alarms. That you hear an alarm, you know what it is. You know, oh yeah, that's a fake alarm. It's gonna go off, I'm, I don't need to respond. Or we delay responding to certain alarms because we, we walk slow because we think, oh, they're gonna self-resolve and stuff like that. And I get it, I get it. But what happens is all of those alarms is disturbing the sea of babies that are in that space that are critically ill that are trying to heal and grow and all that kind of stuff. And understanding that restorative capacity of sleep, which I'll mention in a minute, is undermined when you have all those bells and whistles going off. And even yourself, Denise, I, I loved when you said, you know, you walk into your unit and it's just crazy. And every unit is. And so, and maybe they're not crazy all the time, but there's always an opportunity to improve in the space. And so the design, what their end game was on this paper, and it was done in Tunicus in the Netherlands, was that the, that the single family rooms tended to be quieter, but they also, it's, it wasn't just the acoustic and the, and the layout of the unit, it was also how we programmed monitor alarms, like delays in alarms and that sort of thing, and sending your high and low limits, and all these other factors that come into play when you're talking about sleep. I think we tend to look at things like in these different buckets, and we, we don't appreciate that there's cross-pollination on all of this stuff. Everything affects everything. Everything is touched by everything we do. This was a really interesting study done on 25 babies, and they were looking at the frequency of hands-on care. Was it happening when babies were awake or asleep? And I'm giving you the total abbreviated version of this, but they did AEEG and stuff, so they really had good information about the state of sleep that they were in. And hands-on care, the majority of hands-on care happened when the babies were in active sleep, so that's the REM-like sleep, the stuff that you're trying to preserve in the premature babies. It happened mostly then, and basically, the state of sleep played no, it was not a factor in determining when care is going to be provided. And when you look at the long-term consequences of this, sleep deprivation and or sleep fragmentation is intimately linked to neurodevelopmental compromise. And so again, we've had this discussion earlier about, so what is it? What's causing the problem? Is it the low glucose? Is it the this? Is it the that? Is it? It's everything. It's absolutely everything. I know we want to like just find that one thing that's throwing everything off and just fix it, it's literally everything. And so we need to have that kind of global approach to it. And what's even, maybe not terribly surprising, because again, I think we all sleep, we all know what it looks like, and we have to get our work done. So tough noogies, it's eight o'clock, and you gotta get done up. We, and it's not that we're cruel, it's just we've gotten into these routines and rituals that we really need to take a step back. If we're really adamant about providing infant-driven care, then it's infant-driven care across the board, not just when you're getting fed, but it needs to be all the time because we know that there are some significant deleterious consequences. So what does infant sleep look like? And, and so several people, and, and there are other authors too, that are really smart and have looked at this. If you don't have AEG or video polysomnography and stuff like that, what do you do? Well, people have demonstrated that there are certain behavioral expressions that you will observe that will give you an indicator of where the baby is on their sleep-wake cycling, okay? And so what I, of course, I'm such a nerd. You tell me that, that there's ways of observing this. I'm gonna make a, a little cheat sheet for this. It's a teaching tool and I'm happy to share it with you. So don't get crazy. You just email me or email Kathy and I'm happy to send it out to you. It's a teaching tool and I made it just like the NeoPal. I, I love the PIP tool, 012, you can't go wrong. So if you get all right, 012. And this was based on the literature, looking at indicators that have been associated with sleep. So it's eyes, respirations, facial expressions, or motor activity. The higher your score, the more likely you are to be awake. And the lower your score, the more likely you are to be asleep. And then understanding that the more immature you are, right? Remember that sleep-wake cycle graph? The more immature you are, you spend more time in REM. You don't get that time back. REM goes away over time. And I know that there are some really smart people in um, Florida that are gonna be studying this to really understand the consequences of missing out on REM sleep or when is the better time to wake up a person if you have to wake them up. But right now, just logically, because in the absence of anything, if you're getting a lot of REM sleep here, it ain't coming back, preserve the REM. That's just me, that's just me. And so if you've got a really small person, which basically is less than term, because at term is 50-50, preserve the REM. So, or, or the active sleep, that's what it's called, okay? It's called active sleep. So the lids are closed and you'll see rapid eye movement. Now there are some situations where babies are in active sleep and you don't see rapid eye movement and that's actually associated with poorer neurodevelopmental outcomes. 
It, respirations are usually uneven. You can make faces. And sometimes you might think that they're waking up because they'll make, make a, like a smiley or a kind of a face and you think that they're awake and they're not. And then they do this. I often wake myself up in the middle of the night. Don't know why, but I'll just do it. And so then it moves over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three little video clips of babies. And I know you don't have this to memory, but just in the general gist of what I've been sharing with you, I'm just going to ask you to shout out, what do you think the baby is? Is he asleep or is he awake? OK? You ready, Freddie? Yeah. All right, cool beans. All right, how are we doing? Uh -huh. We're doing good. OK. You want to look at eyes, respiration, face, and movement. Okay. Yeah, good. See, that was the, that, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Yes. What, what did you say? Anybody over here? He was awake. Very good. Yes, his eyes were open. That was the dead giveaway. His eyes were open. He's awake. So that's the easy one, okay? For the most part, if people's eyes are open, they're generally awake, okay? Generally awake, all right? So now I want you to look at this little person, okay? Yeah, he's asleep. Now, it, but it's hard to tell, right? Again, and these are, I just snatched these off of YouTube. I, I could have, if I could have gotten videos and, and gotten a better control. Thank you, dear. We could have get, gotten a little bit more creative, but I believe that this child is asleep, okay? I'm not exactly sure if he's inactive or quiet. The clip wasn't long enough. He was smiling. He could be transitioning to a wakeful state, or that movement could have been the facial activity that we see when people are in active sleep, okay? And then I've got one more baby to show you. This one's a little bit longer. And zoom in on this guy. Which really, you know what, I should have wrote these student loans for the last two years and see if she gets some things like that. And then maybe I can say that. It's like nursing in my days. What do you think? Definitely asleep. Did you observe differences? So when he kind of made the little face thing, and that, that, that was a little active sleep. And again, I don't know where he was in his continuum, because this is just a snapshot. But very good. So you, you're, you're awesome, all right? So now when you belly on up to the incubator, or the woman table, I want you to take this information with you and decide, is this the best time to mess with this person? I know it's 8 o'clock, and I want you to stretch the envelope a little bit, stretch that comfort zone, and say, gee whiz, it looks like he might be in active sleep. I'm going to go and see if somebody else needs my service. Instead of reaching in, flipping and stripping, and doing the person up like mad. Right? Because that's what we do. And the reason why I'm encouraging you not to do this is because we know that these people are profoundly vulnerable and susceptible to their entire experience of care in the neonatal intensive care. Not even talking about their primary pathology. It's just being there during these critical and sensitive periods of development. We know that sleep, healthy sleep, is a super biologically active period in our 24-hour clock, OK? If you have a healthy sleep-wake cycle across the continuum, right, babies to grown-ups, if you have a healthy one, you get this super awesome surge of ATP. Do you remember ATP, adenosine triphosphate? That's like the, when in the literature, it refers to it 
is the brain's cellular currency. So it is the cellular currency of the brain that you don't want to screw around with. Because if you, get, if you have deprivation, what happens is you don't get that surge. So you don't get that booster shot to all of the brain activity that's supposed to be happening to sleep. And you can end up actually depleting your energy stores and then stuff doesn't get done. And remember the, at the beginning, the video and the, the emails, the letters are coming into the inbox and they're bouncing out. Can't process it. For the people that we're taking care of, there is so much stuff going on. If you remember your early, early physiology, developmental physiology, you know that these people are making neurons and synapses like a kajillion, I don't even remember the number, it's like a super psychotically large volume of cells are being churned out, right? And synapses are connecting and all this kind of stuff. And we overproduce brain cells, like we're three years of age, you have more brain cells than the grown-up, right? And what happens, right, you start pruning, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. And so those experiences, good, bad, or indifferent, that are repeated over time, get really secure connections, and then everything else goes to hell in a handbasket because you, you don't need it. You learn what the world is about. The world is a scary, painful, terrifying place. Be prepared, brain, and that's how you walk through the world. We also know that sensory system development, though, is organized during sleep. You've got to just take a pause, right, and think that anything that somebody has to spend 20 odd hours a day doing is probably important. I mean, even full term people, right? They're supposed to be sleeping like something like 15 hours a day ish, give or take. That's more than the day. So it's probably important stuff. And we just come in and yeah. messing around. And I forget the authors of the study, but they actually did an investigation to see nurses' knowledge about sleep. Nurses don't have good knowledge about sleep. We just know that, in general, okay, I know you guys are all wicked smart in here, but the people that were in the study, they didn't know a lot about sleep. And it's because it's one of those, it's like skin. It's in your face. Yep, you're a human, you're a mammal, you sleep. But the details of it, we're not very well versed in. And all the amazing stuff that happens, we don't really understand. And even for ourselves, right, you'd think you'd pay more attention to your own health. We don't. And then, I mean, and all of you guys were pretty shocked by that first video. You're probably all going to go to your chasher's going, I need to get off nights. Oh, my God, i got to get off nights. <laughs> She's going to kill me. <laughs> she or he will kill me. So there's some serious consequences associated with it that, again, I can't draw a straight line. It's sleep deprivation, and that's why they have these neurodevelopmental challenges. It's multifactorial. But let's really kind of take that one out of the equation by being more mindful. When you belly on up to the incubator, again, take a minute. And I, always, I say this in a lot of my talks. I'm going to just say grace. It's an acronym that was developed by this amazing woman. She's a Buddhist monk, Joan Halifax. She created it working with palliative care nurses. But it's during your grace, right, which re really you're just having a pause, your G, gathering your attention, R, recalling your intention, A, attuning to the baby. And while you're doing that, you can look and see where are they at with their sleep. Are they awake or are they asleep? Where are they at in sleep? Maybe. C, consider your options based on your attunement. I'm going to go do up somebody else. Or I'm going to engage, and that's where the E is, engage and end. And so we, we, we need to really be mindful of this because protecting sleep over the lifespan, because these little people, you want them not to just survive, right? It's about thriving and having an excellent quality of life, as excellent as they can, because their blueprint, they've already deviated. They weren't, they weren't supposed to come out early, all this stuff. Their blueprint was for this trajectory, which already gets maligned because of the premature delivery or the, the critical illness or whatever the heck is going on. So our job, right, as nurses is to manage the human experience with disease. And part of that, as Kathy had presented, I think it was yesterday, it just feels like one big blur of knowledge, but about all of the, the wise words of Florence Nightingale. Sleep is critical to health, wellness, and recovery. We, in growth and all these other things that we need to preserve and protect. As part of our commitment to the first admonition, do no harm. And that's all I have, okay? And, and so, let me just, there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Like, no, let's go get some beer. <laughs> Question? Hold on. I'm coming. Oh, yes, ma'am. Re yes, I will. So I've been asked to repeat the mnemonic from Joan Halifax. It's grace, 
G-R-A-C-E. G stands for gather your attention. R is recall your intention. A, attune. C, consider what you're going to do based on your attunement. And E is if you decide to engage. And then end. It's a double E. End. Her name is Halifax. Look up her paper. It's, it's really awesome. You, you'll love it. And it, it, it might sound like it's going to be a nuisance, but it, it will take maybe two minutes, maybe three minutes. When you, and what it does, it allows you to get rid of all that frenetic energy that's on you and be in a better place to be with the patient and do with the patient instead of do to and be at the patient. Any other questions? I was wondering if you had any advice for those of us who feel compelled based on habit or doctor's yeah. orders to do vital signs and feedings every three hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what happens when you come to the bedside and you can clearly see this isn't a good time, yeah. what works for other people to address that? So I, I think change is really challenging. I'm going to talk a lot about change tomorrow. But in the wise world, words of my mother-in-law, other people have probably said it, but I heard it from my mother-in-law, an inch is a cinch, a yard is too hard. So taking baby steps is really important. You're not like, what the heck does that mean? So this is what it means. You're getting ready to do up your baby. It's 8 o'clock, and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, they look like they're asleep. Uh, they, I feel really uncomfortable. Walk away and come back in 10 minutes. Just 10 minutes. Don't go mental. Just 10 minutes. <laughs> just go walk around the unit or something and then come back and just realize nobody died, nothing happened, the world did not end, and look at that. Maybe the baby's awake now. So just try small. I mean, there are other mechanisms, but I think at an individual level, that's the way to just start to release yourself from those habits. I think the grace thing also, I mean, from a meditative, where's the gal that suggested meditation? From a meditative perspective, I think that also helps you realign with your purpose in that moment instead of being like driven by the tasks. So taking a pause is a helpful thing as well. Down and dirty. I was just wondering if they had done any research or thought about if it mattered more the duration of sleep they, the babies got or the amount in a total day or like the intervals of sleep? Yeah. So that's an excellent question. So it is over the 24-hour period, you want to have X amount of sleep depending on where you are on your GA continuum. But babies have sleep cycles just like we do. And generally, on average, it changes across the gestational age continuum. But in general, it's about 70 minutes plus or minus 15. Right? Yeah, something like that, around 70 minutes. And so you don't know, right? When you're coming in at 8 a.m., you don't know where they are in that continuum. And for me to tell you, wait an hour, you might be, you'll be apoplectic. So really, again, what the suggestion was earlier from the sense, I did, the sense program discussion, if you feel like you have to do something, you just, you can't, you're going to lose your mind, you're going to explode, then what I suggest you do is a multimodal way of greeting the baby. All right? Instead of what I, the way I was taught, pop the doors in, reach in, flip and strip, is open the doors gently, give the baby a ver I know you all do it, okay? Give the baby, maybe say something soft, a verbal cue, and just put your hand on a non-vulnerable space, right? So usually that's the back. You know, just put your hand on their back and watch them respond. Just like, you know, I mean, I guess it depends on how much you love your loved ones, but if you're, when you're waking up your loved ones, right, sometimes... You, you know, you get down and you go, honey, it's time to get up for school. Other times you just slam the door and you go, get up for school. Well, when you reach in and you flip and strip, it's the get up for school approach versus the honey. And if you've ever had anybody do that to you, the honey mode is way better, way, way better. So think about that, you know, with regards to your baby. I mean, because that's just being nice. Animals respond the same way, okay? I mean, and I, I think sometimes... Some of us are nicer to our pets than we are to the people that we serve. I hope that doesn't sound too harsh, but okay. I do developmental assessments in our unit. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times when I watch the babies, even though they're asleep, they're transitioning from drowsy to this really mm -hmm. reluctant, I'm awake because yeah. the alarms went off, yeah. and noise is such a persistent thing, and a lot of it is startled noises. Like yes this alarm or that. Yep. So even though you catch a baby when they're awake to do cares, these kids are still sleep deprived. They are. Do you have any suggestions? To help them with that? So, all right, uh, not to sound like a broken record to all the other folks that have spoken today, kangaroo care. 
if you are up against it with trying to figure out how to protect their sleep in a meaningful way with a quality sleep experience, kangaroo care is the way to go. Well proven in the literature, right? Promotes sleep maturation, promotes autonomic maturation. If you've got somebody who's having lots of A's and B's, it, instead of reaching for the caffeine or meth methylxanthine, throw them on the, the, the chest, right? And watch how many fewer spells they'll have in kangaroo. So I think that's the thing. I love, though, that you said about the startle. And I think if you come upon them and they're startled, they're, they're frightened, just like anybody. Having a reassuring voice. When you give a reassuring voice, mama ease, you use any kind of vocalizations, it releases oxytocin, and that soothes and calms. It's the antithetical hormone to cortisol. So if you can do that, if you see them you know, kind of startled like that, just give them a little containment and give them some soft vocal reassurances, and it will help settle them down. It may not make them go back to sleep, but it will at least maybe soothe them a little bit. Is that helpful? Get the hook, because I, I could talk for hours, OK? Oh, no hook. I'm all done being stressed out now. It's a captive audience. <laughs> all, all good? Thank you so very much. I massively appreciate you guys' attention and everything. Thank Thanks. you, Miss Mary. You can stay up here for a sec, because I want you to help me with my announcements. Ah, OK. You're, you're going to help me. So I wanted to take a moment and introduce a very special woman who's with us that if you have not met her yet and you have not had a chance to meet her, I would just wanted to introduce her. So this is Lori Brittingham. Do you know her? Do you know the name? So Lori is our just immediate past president of um, NAN, so our National Association of Neonatal Nurses. And she's here, and we just wanted to thank her for being with us and also to ask her to help me do something special. So without further ado. So as you know, every year since last year, <laughs> every year, every year, we are giving away what's known as the One Nurse Award. And so the One Nurse Award is someone who embodies this idea that I shared with you yesterday. It is the meaning of what one person can do to change the life of others. And so this one nurse is someone who is very passionate about what the profession of nursing is and the power of nursing, as well as that recognition for trying to make baby brains healthier, families more functional, and just doing that through connection and connecting. And so when I asked some people for some input on this year's winner, these are the words that people said. Badass, awesome, brilliant, motivational, hysterical, comical, Hopeful, humble, <laughs> passionate, dynamic, energetic. And the last one? Wicked. <laughs> Wicked. <laughs> Wicked. And so this person, Mary Coughlin, who is the winner of this year's <laughs> One Nurse Award. <laughs> oh my god. I thought it was a really awesome person that put up <laughs> Wicked. Oh my god. <laughs> Well, it is an awesome person who is winning this award. Has um, been a speaker at all three one conferences. Was unanimously chosen by our planning committee, and she is passionate about her patriots. She is humble, and she loves nurses and she loves babies. And so we are just beyond thrilled that she is with us. And I'm glad it was a surprise. I put yes, <laughs> on the bottom. <laughs> and, so, and so I would just like to say thank you, Mary, for all that you do on behalf of everyone, and that you are this year's 2019 oh One Nurse. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So will you make a speech? Oh, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just oh, kidding. my God. I am so, I am so honored. I am so humbled. And Wicked moved. <laughs> Thank you. Very, I was thinking whoever wrote Wicked was just a wicked cool person. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I am so, so honored. I am beyond myself right now. So thank you. Oh, my God. I get, I get, I get, get that. I can imagine what my face looks like right now. Oh, beautiful. Your face looks oh. beautiful. 
If you oh. turn it around, yes, you go. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it's fancy like that. You have to look look at it. Oh my God, it has my name on it. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. You all have to come and see this. This is really nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Love you. I'm thank so you. Sorry. Love you. So, anyway, I just want to thank you all for giving her and just thank another round of applause. And I, know, I must be. I look like a wreck. <laughs> Well, you can go touch oh, up your makeup really and we'll take some photos. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed that presentation from our 2019 One Conference in San Diego. And a little bit of a sneak peek at the end there into the award ceremony where we surprised Mary with the One Nurse Award for 2019. It was such a special moment. I'm glad that we were able to keep that here in the recording and share that with you as well. I hope that brought back memories if you were there in person or just made you feel like you were there with us and honoring her and all the work that she's done. If you haven't already, go ahead and click that like and subscribe button right here on our channel. And that tells YouTube that you like videos like this and it helps us bring you more free content. So this series is a series of four videos in December. If you'd like to get the slides or other resources or just reminders about the upcoming videos in this series, go ahead and click the link below in the show notes or scan the QR code here on the screen and you can get access to those as well. And I hope that I'll see you on the next one. Have a great week. Bye.